There is no question that modern 3D printers are incredibly fast. When I first got into this hobby, you are lucky to push beyond 30 millimeters per second print speeds, but nowadays it's common to see print speeds of 200 millimeters per second and above. This means that prints complete much faster than they used to, but did you know we can still go faster? In this video, I'm gonna outline the things you can change in your settings to print even quicker on already fast 3D printers to get prints done in sometimes less than half the time of what the default settings allow. Let's get started. How's it going guys, Angus here from Makers Muse and welcome back to another 3D Printing 101. Now, back in the day, if you wanted to print faster, the first thing to change was layer height because a finer layer height means that a print will have more layers in it, therefore it'll take longer than a print with a coarser layer height. For example, going from a 0.1 layer height to a 0.2, well, you're reducing the layers by half, therefore it should take half the amount of time in theory anyway. But these days that sort of logic doesn't really hold up because modern 3D printers print so rapidly that we've actually started to hit the physical limits of how fast you can melt the plastic through hot ends. So with modern 3D printers, the actual thing that's limiting how fast you can print is known as your max volumetric speed. That is to say how fast you can turn that solid plastic into molten plastic through a hot end to print out your part. Max volumetric speed is measured in millimeters cubed per second. So it literally is how much volume of plastic can be pushed out of that nozzle. How quickly can you force plastic to melt and extrude out of your nozzle will determine how fast you can 3D print your object. And this is the first number you want to look at possibly changing in your slicer. This is because universally defaults tend to be quite conservative. Brands want to make sure your prints succeed 100% of the time in any environment or circumstance. So they will set the max volumetric speed at a number that is fairly conservative where they know it'll work. However, I will mention that I tend to see this number being lower in generic printing profiles compared to profiles with a brand's own filament. Now I could say that they're just being conservative or I could say perhaps they want their own profiles with their own filament to look like it prints faster. But if you wanna print quicker, well, it's highly likely you can probably bump this number up a bit without really seeing any decrease in quality. But how far can you push this number? Could you just enter a few zeros and just make the printer go at max speed possible by the mechanics? Well, obviously not. There is definitely gonna be a limit where if you push too much filament through that hot end, it will start to under extrude because it can't maintain the temperature to melt that filament at the throughput you're pushing it through. It'll start to fail, under extrude and possibly jam and your print will, will not work. So if you wanna mess with this number, I recommend doing a few test prints. You can actually create your own with tiered layers of max volumetric speed starting at a low number and ending at a very high number. And you can assess the print quality of that to see where it starts to degrade and then choose somewhere below that to choose a nice sweet spot that should work for most circumstances. But again, this number is set in the slicer to be conservative and reliable. So if you don't really need that extra massive increase in speed, then you don't really need to change this because there are a lot of other things you can change your slicer to increase print speed without possibly affecting extrusion reliability. And the second major setting that will affect your print time is infill settings. Now with default settings, I find that universally infill is set way too high. And this means that for small prints, fine, doesn't really matter. But if you're filling the bed with a really large print, the infill that's set in the default profile is so wasteful. It is ridiculous. And for some reason, a lot of brands still use like grid infill at a high percentage. I don't know why they do this, but for example, they'll have a high gyroid, high grid, or even high cubic, but they'll have it at too high of a density to realistically make sense. And it wastes plastic and wastes time. So the first thing I'll look at changing with a large print is my infill type. I personally really like support cubic. It's a really neat infill type that changes the size of these sort of cuboid cells, depending on what the geometry of the print is that needs to be supported. So for a very large box, for example, it'll have very large voids that then start to get tighter and tighter as it comes around to support the top of the print. And I find that support cubic set at 10 to 15% density is a reliable infill that uses way less material than any other infill type. But if you want as little infill as possible, well, you have two other options. The other is lightning. I'm personally not a fan of lightning, even though it's a very innovative infill type. It's effectively single wall support structures within the print that will hold the areas of the print that need to form above it. It will use very little material and takes very little time to print, 
but it offers nothing in the way of strength to the part. Now I know most of the part strength is from the outside of it, the actual skin, the, the perimeters, but in this case, for example, this dice tower, the internal void is completely unsupported using lightning infill, but with support cubic, there's those nice lines that will provide some rigidity and strength. But finally, sometimes prints don't need infill at all. If the internal overhangs are gentle enough for the previous layer to support them, then you don't actually need infill at all. And also top flat surfaces can just bridge like normal. So for some cases, you might not need any support at all. Just maybe add an extra perimeter to give the whole part a bit more strength, and then you'll save so much time and material. If you're unsure, try a few different types and check the G-Code preview to make sure nothing just appears in midair and see if you could get away with minimal infill, cubic infill, lightning, or nothing at all. The next setting you can change is your print sequence. If you're printing multiple items at once, then it might be advisable to print them one at a time instead of all at once layer by layer. Printing one at a time isn't for everything. It only really applies to small parts that you can spread across the whole print bed with enough clearance around them that the nozzle won't collide with previously printed parts as it moves on to the next one. However, if you're able to print these parts one at a time, there are several key benefits. Number one is it's actually quicker than printing all the parts at the same time layer by layer because you're removing the travel moves between each layer of those parts. Imagine for each layer, it's jumping between each part because it's building them up layer by layer at the same time and each travel movement adds up to a longer print time. The second major benefit is if a print fails, well then it's not going to cascade onto the next one. In this example, I actually had one of my hubs come loose because I didn't really clean the print bed well enough and it did come loose and fall off the print bed but it just failed and then the printer moved on to the next one, which printed perfectly. So if I had actually printed this batch layer by layer all at once, it would have wiped the whole thing out and I would have had to start again from scratch. Tip number two is to optimize your print orientation. If you can make your print sit on a bed in such a way that there's no overhangs that need support, in such a way there's less travel movements, so the printer can just run long extrusion lines really fast and then move up to the next layer and continue, then you're going to optimize your print time. When you're designing a part to be printed, it's really important to be mindful of the orientation it will be printed in because it may be different to the orientation it's actually used. You gotta sort of have a think about how you wanna manufacture that part. And sometimes it's very different to how you're actually going to use it. But personally, what I try to do is I try to make sure that first layer is as flat as possible with as much surface area as possible on that print bed. So I'll often go out of my way to figure out a print orientation that has as much surface area on the bed as possible and then gentle overhangs that need as little support material as possible. Because that takes us onto the next point and that is minimizing or removing the need for support material altogether. Because requiring support material will add a lot of print time to your part. I totally get it. Sometimes you cannot avoid the need for support material in your design. There's just areas that have to be supported, whether you couldn't get the overhang shallow enough or you couldn't get away with bridging, but it's important to be mindful of how that support material is generated and actually try to control it as much as possible. So I very rarely will use automatic supports. Unless I'm being very lazy and it's an organic part and I've got all the time in the world, I'll try to use manual supports and be very mindful of areas that I think don't actually need support material and areas that I think I could get away with just a small amount where it supports the area that forms over nothing and then from there it could perhaps bridge and that doesn't need support where that area has been bridged. Now there is actually a setting which lets you turn off support in bridges now, which is very handy, but it doesn't always apply to certain designs. So again, check that G-code preview and use the manual support painting mode to highlight overhangs and see exactly where that support material will be needed and paint it in. The different support modes also take different amounts of time depending on the geometry, so play around with that as well. See what it looks like in the preview and see what the time difference is. Sometimes it's quite substantial, but again, the cleanup might be more difficult or more challenging, or you might need really reliable support columns, in which case I tend to use the snug support mode. The next thing to look at when speeding up your prints is to not use multicolor or multi-material. Now I know these modern printers like the Bamboo Labs and that have the AMS systems and it makes it really easy to use multicolor in your prints. You just have different spools. You can even paint them in different areas, different color, and it will very intelligently swap between those filaments. But that will add so much time to your print. I cannot overstate how long multicolor prints take compared to their single color counterparts. It's incredible how long it takes and the waste as well if it's a single nozzle system is out of control. But let's just say you do really need a different color in your print. For example, you've got text and you wanna highlight it, or in this example, I wanna make the ears a different color. Well, to do multicolor, but in a much more time efficient manner, 
I recommend just using this plus icon and doing a color change at height. Now you can do this manually on many printers. It'll just pause the printer, wait for you to change the filament. But with the AMS system, it'll do it automatically with the bamboo machines. But this will take a long time if you have that prime column, especially if it's right at the top of the print. So I would actually just say, turn that prime column off because I know for a fact that the prime and purge routine in the bamboo systems is very thorough. I don't think you'd actually see any real difference using the column or not in this circumstance, unless you're going between a really dark filament to a light filament, like from black to white, you may need to use a prime column to get that last bit of pigment out before swapping to the new color. The next thing to look at when speeding up your prints is to disable all the startup faffing about that these modern printers do. Do you really need to do an automatic bed level before every single print? Do you need to monitor the extrusion of the print as it's running and do a little like test line? Probably not. But the major one I will warn you about is the time-lapse mode in a lot of these printers. Because for example, with the A1, it's a bed sling, which means the bed moves back and forth. And to use the time-lapse mode, it'll actually move the print bed and head to a certain position and then take that photo. So it'll actually move and travel it out of the print and then take the photo and then move back in. So it'll actually affect print quality as well as adding time. And do you really need that time-lapse? No one's really wowed by 3D printing time-lapses in 2025. But there are a few usability things I do as well that uh, make my life easier and speed up the time from, from slice to print even further. The first thing is to make sure you know what's loaded into the printer. I know it sounds silly, but my print is like in the garage and it's far away. So if I want to slice to it, I need to know what filament's loaded into it. I'm not using the RFID tag filament on a AMS system. I don't know what's attached to the printer. I don't know how much filament is on that roll. So I always make sure if I'm in the area to visually check and be like, okay, I'm gonna be slicing this in future. I'm gonna change over to this color now when I'm in the area because the load and unload routines take a little bit of time, but it's not too bad if you're doing something else in the vicinity. But if you're getting ready to slice and you're like, oh, I need to change the filament, blah, blah, blah. That's valuable time that you could be using to do other things. The next thing to speed up prints, which I tend to do all the time, is I just hit preheat, then I start slicing. Because by the time the slicing and preparation and the faffing about's complete, and I send it to the printer, the printer is at temperature. That means it doesn't have to spend time warming up, but especially if you're printing high temperature filaments, like, a, like ABS for example, you want the chamber to be at a high ambient temperature. And if you just send a print and it slices, warms up and starts printing, sometimes that chamber doesn't get hot enough and you can run into warping issues. So you wanna saturate it with as much heat as possible. And the easiest way to do that is to just preheat and then start doing your slicing and settings and that. So by the time you're ready to slice, the chamber is nice and toasty, ready to go. If you want even more tips to power up your 3D printing skills, then maybe consider checking out my ebook, The Ultimate Book of 3D Printing Tips and Tricks. This ebook has been updated for 2025 for modern 3D printing hardware and is full of tips and tricks to improve your 3D printing experience whether it's from the design, slicing, or printing stage. It covers everything you need to know to get the best out of this amazing technology, and you can find a link to it in the description below. Thanks for watching, guys. Bye.